importance of state power. So, today's agenda, we're going to first look at film adaptation theory and explore some of the basic theory that allows us to assess the context of a film's adaptation to production uh, in order to examine how cinema takes the critiques of dystopian novels and applies them to its own era. But of course, this is in the English department, so we have our four artifacts right there. Um, and I'm going to look at just two examples from each artifact. Um, so please ask me about more in the questions. And then finally, we'll round it off by looking at some metacinematic moments in both film adaptations. So this was the uh, title of my research paper. Um, you see the obligatory use of parentheses right there. Uh, <laughs> and the primary focus is on the way that film adaptations conceptualize this control of the visual as a way that Cold War authoritarian regimes projected power. Let's take a look at some criticisms of the film. Uh, not exactly lavish praise here, but um, they tend to bemoan how the film <laughs> depart from their textual origins. In context, the first comment is preoccupied with certain changes that Wells made, uh, while the second laments an uncreative um, cinematic reproduction of Bradbury's novel. So these two quotations highlight a central dilemma of film adaptation, um, which is fidelity to a precursor text has been the dominant measure of an adaptation's scope and work. Um, so departures from a book are considered um, betrayal or mostly frowned upon, but adhering too closely to the text um, invite accusations of being uncreative. And so adaptation theorists, in light of these, um, this, this trend in criticism, have pushed for increased consideration of contextual factors, uh, political, historical, cultural, that inform the production of a movie. So such a focus can help illustrate what new contributions films make that expand upon their textual origins in addition to maintaining fidelity to, uh, to the book via thematic consistency with the novels. Dystopian narratives. So just a brief background, both novels that I'm looking at share elements of dystopian novels in their focus on societies that appear functional but are actually hugely problematic. And so the, uh, these novels critique extreme state governance that is often justified by societal aspirations of uh, infinite progress, stability, and efficiency and a, a main form of authoritative control uh, within these societies is, of course, monitoring information and obsessive surveillance. So building off that, let's think about our two films, um, produced in 1962 and 1966, uh, which is a Cold War era that saw the rise of dictatorships, um, from European fascism to authoritarianism in the Soviet Union um, to dictatorships in South Korea and Thailand. And consistent within all these regimes, is the manipulation of visual media, primarily cinema, to present the image of forward-moving and prosperous societies. So we reached my thesis, which is, uh, I will argue that the adaptations of The Trial and Swearing Act 451 do two things that maintain fidelity to the text. One, they sustain the novel's critique of governance and visual abuse, um, a type of authoritative control that asserts the authority of the state whilst concealing its major dysfunctions. And two, the movies address specific historical moments that inform the cinematic productions, gesturing at how cinema itself as a medium also contributes to this tyranny. So our first dyad today, we're going to take a look at the trial. Uh, this is a world filled with the absurd and uncanny pervasion of the law. Our protagonist, Joseph K., who's referred to as simply K. throughout the novel, uh, he's arrested from the outset, and he spends the entire story maneuvering through the invisible hierarchy of the courts uh, without ever actually reaching his trial or indeed finding out and discovering uh, the reason for his arrest in the first place. And so the state in the novel prominently depicts power through visual means, and all these visual projections also serve to conceal the system's failure to deliver justice. So we're going to take a look at the first example of visual abuse and control uh, in the appearance of court officials and the accused. As you can see, there's a contrast between their clothing. We can see the accused are immediately marginalized. Uh, in contrast to the bold dress of state officials. Uh, and these state officials ignore the presence of the accused and, in fact, leave them often standing in court corridors um, where their physical frailty is openly uh, displayed for others, including K, to C. So that's the way that, um, visibly, the accused are marginalized. And then we're going to take a look at the second example, uh, the use of painting. And so in the novel, um, court corridors are adorned with the painting of senior judges. And these paintings are often exaggerated artistic representations of judges who appear um, extremely decisive and powerful. However, these paintings are far cry from reality. For example, Kay's own lawyer actually is ill and bedridden throughout most of the novel. So we can see the contrast here between the projection of power through the paintings. 
And then the second quotation here, a fellow defendant's reaction to the picture of a judge he has never actually met. Um, and it really illustrates the court's obsession with projecting its power and status. As we can see, it's a successful projection because the portrait here quickly becomes larger than life as the defendant can easily uh, identify uh, who the judge is. So let's move on to the film uh, by Orson Welles. As you can see here, this, this is a scene of the accused. And we can see that um, the accused are reduced, not only in terms of uh, they're visually, uh, they're unclothed and reduced to rags, but they're also merely numbered in this case, which is um, a difference from the novel. And um, this also evokes images of liberated Holocaust survivors. And so this film edition here addresses the state's capacity to exercise extreme dehumanization, visually evoking the temporary subjugation of individuals to the whims of an authoritarian regime. And if we consider our second example here with regards to the painting, we can see here this scene. Joseph K., he's exploring the maze of back rooms uh, of his lawyer's study, and he comes upon this portrait of the judge, but it's tipped on its side. And um, amongst all these discarded manuscripts, suggests attempts to hide this picture and keep it out of sight. Um, however, the painting returns later on the wall of the study, the lawyer's study. And here we have the corn merchant on the right, and um, he immediately recognizes the portrait without having ever met him. And so the picture's reappearance suggests the state's preoccupation with asserting power through visual means, bringing out the exaggerated artistic representation when defendants are present. So we're going to switch now to the world of Fahrenheit 451. Um, the authorities in charge here are preoccupied with what society reads. The books are taboo, and they are burned by firemen. And our protagonist, Guy Montag, has worked for the fire department all his life, until he begins doubting the regime's claim that literature is inherently destabilizing. Uh, meanwhile, the rest of his society has been reduced to a culture of unobservant automatons who only respond to entertainment and day in, day out, gorge on advertisements and wall-sized television screens. So our first example of visual control is looking at the effect of fire. We can see in this world, flames visually captivate both firemen and also members of society who actually gather around the act of burning books as opposed to question this visual spectacle of um, destroying these manuscripts. And this really illustrates the state reliance on visual allure uh, to control the masses. As we can see, even the use of the word now really suggests the visual spectacle of gathering up the masses. And our second example, um, with regards to a manhunt of Montag towards the end, um, in defying the regime by secretly reading books, Montag is labeled an enemy of society by the state, and uh, which exploits wall screens that are present in every single uh, individual's household, um, and broadcasts Montag fleeing as, as a fleeing traitor. And so the first quotation here illustrates how visually arresting the broadcast is, uh, as Montag sees him, an image of himself on the television screen and cannot pull away from watching himself being broadcast. Um, and eventually he loses the authorities on his tail, um, who instead capture an innocent bystander in order to project the regime's competence in uh, hunting down dissidents. So we can see here at the second quotation, it shows the visual highlight right at the end of the chase, which really exemplifies the capture of Montag to the, uh, the audience who is watching the show. So let's go to the film. Um, here's a scene right at the beginning. It really exemplifies the public spectacle of uh, book burning. Um, and the scene really addresses contemporary examples of the same act in authoritarian regimes, um, including in 1964 when Brazil's military dictatorship branded all books as subversive. Or in 1966, mass burnings of texts in uh, Mao Zedong's China um, were considered, uh, these books were considered particularly distasteful and were burned. <coughs> and then we look at um, the manhunt. This scene gestures at the contemporary use of American media to perpetuate an enemy image of the Soviet Union, and it really works to unify American subjects um, and motivate them for action. And so the mass broadcast theme of Montag's escape um, addresses this historical exploitation of visual elements uh, to identify societal enemies and turn unsuspecting viewers against them. And to the final part of my presentation, we're going to look at how both adaptations maintain fidelity to their novel's critique of governance um, in their exploration of the filmic medium itself. So let's start with Orson Welles' The Trial. This adaptation visualizes a parable in the novel. Um, this parable features a countryman seeking and failing to gain admittance to the law, uh, which is a clear parallel to K. This visualization is actually moved to introduce the film um, and really sets the tone for the protagonist's own tribulation. Later on in the movie, K actually encounters the parable in the form of a slideshow projection, 
which his lawyer described as a visual aid we use to give sermons. So Kay's interaction with the parable suggests that audiences of Wells' movie, who saw the parable at the very beginning of the film, the audiences of the movie are in fact just like the protagonist, watching a visual instrument of the state. So this scene really uh, eerily implies that the whole film is just one long sermon given by a senior lawyer to a defendant, and the defendants are represented by the audience at large. And so here, Wells' adaptation investigates film as an effective arm of the dictatorial apparatus. And then finally, we're going to take a look at Fahrenheit 451. Um, this scene is when Guy Montag, our protagonist, first reads books. And when he does, the camera um, rapidly whip pans horizontally across the lines as if mimicking the, uh, the, the act of reading. And this rapid whip panning is incredibly jarring to watch, especially when it's contrast with the um, conventional composition of film, which includes long, long takes, establishing shots, um, and stills. And so this jarring contrast um, suggests that, uh, associates reading with a discomfort, uh, with discomfort, um, illustrating the appeal of visually consuming information, like the rest of society does in Fahrenheit 451. And finally, um, it's towards the end of the film, Montag asks his superior um, about the appeal of fire and flame. And his superior explains that flames are appealing because um, fire is constant motion. And if we think about it, so is film. Film is the perpetual motion of still images, constantly changing to give the illusion of movement on screen. And so this parallel eerily suggests, this parallel between film and fire eerily suggests that cinema too, like fire in Fahrenheit 451, can render audiences to the same unthinking mindsets as of spectators gathering around book burning. And I've reached the end of my presentation. I'd like to thank my um, advisor, Jessica, along with Pierre, whose uh, advice and consultation helped me hone my thesis and paper, uh, my housemate and hunt, and friend, of course, for some support.
Um, this is not exactly about the um, or books themselves, but where would you place PowerPoint on the spectrum of <laughs> dynamic, hypnotic, to static engaging? Static. <laughs> 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 more at the other end. Yeah. Um, because <laughs> that's right. So I know where you're, I know where you're trying to get at. In that. Am I am I am I contributing to the tyranny of cinematic or visual? <laughs> <laughs> uh, the answer is hopefully no. <laughs>